This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Here is a cosine function with a frequency of 1 hertz, and I am going to sample it with a frequency of 7 hertz, meaning I'll have 7 equally spaced snapshots of the function essentially every second, if we think about the x-axis as time. Now, if I take away the original signal and just handed you these samples, and I told you the original signal was a cosine function with no phase, amplitude of 1, and it was sampled at a rate of 7 hertz, so you know mostly everything. Could you then determine what the original signal was? Or asked in a different way, are there any other sinusoids that would have these exact same values and thus would look exactly like this if sampled at 7 hertz? Well, our original signal with a frequency of 1 hertz, of course, contains all these samples. Now, if we plot a sinusoid with a frequency of 2 hertz, notice it does not contain all these samples. Neither does 3 hertz or 4. But once we hit 6 hertz, all the samples line up with this new function. The same thing also happens at 8 hertz, 13 hertz, 15 hertz, and infinitely many more. So you could not tell me the original function if I gave you these samples. Because all the other information is lost and you'd have no idea whether the original was this or this or something else. It could technically be anything that goes through all of these sample points, but if we stick to just sinusoids, then you still have unlimited choices. However, Notice that 1 hertz, the actual original signal, is the lowest frequency that you could guess. If we go down to anything else, like 0.5 hertz, this clearly will not go through all the samples, and nothing below 1 hertz will. Now, if we go back to our original 1 hertz signal and sample it a little slower, let's say 4 times per second, well now the same thing will happen, but at different frequencies. These samples correspond to our original 1 hertz signal, but also a 3 hertz signal will go through all these points. Same with 5 hertz, 7 hertz, and all odd numbers. You could guess any of these from the samples given, but 1 hertz is still the lowest. However, going back to our original signal, something happens when you take the sampling frequency below 2 hertz. Let's say we sample at 1.5 hertz. Now, if I gave you these samples, there are still infinitely many other sinusoids that could contain these, like one with a frequency of 2 hertz or 2.5 hertz. But now another sinusoid that works is one with a frequency of 0.5 hertz, which is a lower frequency than our original signal. So of the infinitely many correct guesses you can make, the original is not the one with the lowest frequency. In this case, there is one option lower. This change happens when your sampling frequency is less than twice the frequency of your original sinusoid. The original was 1 hertz, meaning you need a sample at more than 2 hertz or you'll get this issue. What we just saw is basically the idea behind the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, which says you have to sample your signal at a rate faster than twice the highest frequency in your original signal to avoid distortion. This is why, for example, when I open Audacity to record this video, there's a preset to a frequency of 44.1 kilohertz. That number is slightly more than double the maximum frequency humans can hear, 20 kilohertz. So here's where that comes from. Sine waves have frequency domains that just look like this. These two spikes really represent one single frequency, that is, the sine wave itself. But most other functions, like a sync function for example, have a continuous spectrum of frequencies that make it up. But now if I sample our signal, what are the frequencies that make this up? Yes, as in what sine functions make up a bunch of samples or spikes? Well, I'll just tell you the answer, and I'm going to make some room here, is you just take the original frequency domain function and make copies of it 
around integer multiples of the sampling frequency. So if we are sampling at 7 hertz, then this would be 7 and 14 and so on, both positive and negative. And we do this forever. So the frequencies that make up a bunch of samples is this here. That's weird, and it makes sense. Because the Fourier transform that calculates a function's frequency domain has this really nice property that it works in reverse. The Fourier transform of a sinc function is the rectangular function, which means the Fourier transform of the rectangular function is the sinc function. Technically, applying the Fourier transform twice gives you the original function reflected about the y-axis, but since this is a symmetric function, we could kind of ignore it here. Now, any periodic function that does the same thing over and over can be made up of several sinusoids at discrete frequencies, not a continuous spectrum of them. So the frequency domain looks like this. These spikes at different frequencies that represent the sinusoids that make it up. Or the Fourier series, really. But this means, using that reverse operation, that if we have a bunch of spikes or samples as our original function, its frequency domain will look like a periodic function, what we just saw. So that's why this sample discrete function has a Fourier transform that is periodic. You can think about it backwards, and it makes more sense. I'm not going to show the math of convolution in this video, because I feel it needs its own, but that's how you would mathematically find this function. Essentially, sampling a signal is like multiplying it by all these samples or Dirac delta functions, and multiplying in time means doing convolution in the frequency domain, which kind of involves sliding one function against another. So that's what leads to this periodic function to infinity. But now, if someone gave you this sampled function whose frequency domain looks like this, you could apply a low-pass filter to the sampled signal and remove the higher frequencies, giving you back your original frequency domain centered at zero, and thus you could reconstruct your signal. And the reason for even doing this, like why sample at all, is because you can send those samples through a computer to do complicated stuff. If you just use the continuous signal of like someone's voice, if you wanna do something to it, you need circuits which take time to build and aren't so easy to change, whereas a computer program is very easy to change. Now, because these copies happen at integer multiples of the sampling frequency, if you sample at a slower rate, those copies start to come together until you reach a point where they intersect and combine. This is called aliasing, and that's when you lose information, because even when you apply a filter, you're not getting back the original signal. There's distortion due to the slow sampling and the resulting interference in the frequency domain. And that aliasing will happen once your sampling frequency dips below twice the highest frequency in your signal. That's where the overlap starts to happen. And if you sample slower and slower, you get more interference where these would add together and you could not reconstruct your original signal. So now, to bring it full circle, if you were wondering how I was getting these functions before that would have the same sample values, and how we know there's nothing in between that also works, it's because of what I just showed. Here is our original cosine function, frequency 1 hertz, and here's the Fourier transform. It's two spikes really representing a single frequency of 1 hertz. It's just mirrored over the y-axis for reasons, so you actually have a spike at plus and minus 1 hertz. But now, when you sample this signal up top at, let's say, 7 hertz, to find what the new frequency domain looks like, you make copies at 7 hertz, 14, 21, and so on. Same with the negative values. So in the frequency domain after sampling, we'll find spikes at 6 hertz, 8 hertz, 13, 15, and all the numbers I showed before. That is where they come from. And if I zoom in a bit first, then we lower the sampling frequency to 1.5 hertz, the copies start to cross each other. And in this case, we're left with one frequency spike at 0.5 here, which is lower than our original signal. So that's why a lower frequency guess is valid from these samples. You didn't sample fast enough, and thus aliasing occurred. 
To avoid that, you need to sample at a rate at least twice that of the highest frequency in your signal. So that is the idea behind the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem. And if you enjoyed what you saw here, I highly recommend checking out Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. Brilliant is an educational platform home to thousands of lessons in math, science, and engineering, with new lessons being added monthly. And a big focus with Brilliant is real-world applications, as they show you exactly how to apply the formulas and concepts within their lessons. Their Vector Calculus course, for example, goes through several topics in multivariable and vector calculus, which includes Fourier transforms, a crucial topic in math, science, and engineering. And there you'll get to learn more of these advanced topics through practice problems, visuals, and their interactive exercises. And as you can see, there are so many courses to choose from, so no matter what your background, there will be something for you. And you can now try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days. Just go to brilliant.org slash zackstar or click the link in the description below. Plus, the first 200 of you to sign up will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. With that, going to end that video there. Thanks, as always, to my supporters on Patreon. Social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you all in the next video.